Hello everyone and welcome back to the Fluctus channel. Aircraft carriers allow the Navy to utilize a fully mobilized air force almost anywhere in the world. Since World War II, many aircraft models have been designed to operate from an aircraft carrier deck. Among the most successful are the F-A-18 Hornet, the Grumman C-2 Greyhound, the E-2 Hawkeye, the F-14 Tomcat. One notable exception to the list is the F-15 Eagle. The U.S. Navy did, at one point, consider replacing the aging F-14 with a carrier version of the F-15. The F-14 is well known as one of the larger air superiority fighters, with a fuselage length of 62 feet and a wingspan of up to 64 feet. That said, it was developed specifically for operation on an aircraft carrier. Indeed, the F-14 was in service from 1974 until the early 2000s, with just over 700 total aircraft produced between 1969 and 1991. Though multiple variants were introduced over the years, the F-14 began to experience limitations. These included maintenance issues, which drove up costs. They also had multiple engine issues, including issues with stalling, which put aviator lives at risk. The F-15 had been designed by McDonnell Douglas specifically for the United States Air Force. A twin-engine, all-weather fighter, it was slightly longer than the F-14, but had a wingspan that was 20 feet shorter. The F-15 has been prized for its speed and maneuverability for decades. At high altitudes, it can reach speeds of over 1,600 miles per hour. This was all thanks to its two Pratt & Whitney F-100 afterburning turbofans, which can produce up to 23,770 pounds of thrust with afterburners engaged. The F-15 also boasted an incredible rate of climb, roughly 67,000 feet per minute. With an armament comparable to the Tomcat, but more than double the combat range, the Strike Eagle seemed to be a willing counterpart or successor to the Tomcat. Though the F-15A already had a tail hook, it was used only for emergencies. As such, McDonnell Douglas needed to create a more heavy-duty tail hook that could provide maximum stoppage with every landing. They also designed the wings of the F-15 to fold up at a 90-degree angle, roughly 15 feet from each tip. This would drastically reduce how much storage space the F-15 took up, something the Tomcat was notorious for. Most important of all was the swapping out of the F-15's existing landing gear. Operating aboard a ship, 
requires a much more heavy-duty gear setup, so a much more rugged system was installed. The problem of the F-15 was that the Navy wanted it to carry the latest missile, the Phoenix. However, these missiles and the radar guidance system used to power them added 10,000 additional pounds to the F-15. This extra weight not only restricted its ability to land on an aircraft carrier, but negated the performance advantages it had over the F-14. The F-15's tail hook never saw much use aboard an aircraft carrier, but it proved extremely useful when the United States Air Force introduced the BAK-12 program. This is similar to the arresting system used aboard carriers, only designed for use on land in case of aircraft overshooting or losing control during landings. They feature a cable or series of cables stretched across the runway. These cables are attached to special multi-disc rotary friction energy absorbers. Each cable has rollers that elevate it just above the runway, allowing the tail hook of the aircraft to make solid contact with it. If there were no emergency, a plane like the F-15 could pass over the cable without issue. If there were an emergency, it could deploy its hook and allow the powerful energy absorbers to bring it to a safe stop. The process of certifying the BAK-12 took several years and required multiple aircraft types. In the end, the BAK-12 was rated for absorbing up to 180 knots of force, which represents a plane traveling at up to 207 miles per hour. All BAK-12 systems are recertified every year. Over the years, many different aircraft have been tasked with landing on an aircraft carrier for one reason or another. One of the most well-known instances of a plane being converted for carrier service is the story of the U-2G. The U-2 was a high-altitude spy plane introduced in 1956. With its thin fuselage, powerful engine, and 103-foot wingspan, the U-2 had a reputation for being incredibly difficult to fly and land. So when it came time to prepare it for carrier operations, the Navy decided to reinforce the wings and landing gear of three older U-2s. They added spoilers to help reduce speed and landing distance, as well as a tail hook. Though the tests proved successful, the U-2G never saw actual deployment aboard an aircraft carrier. Many think this had to do with how the aircraft tips after landing, forcing the wings to absorb the moving ship's motion.
even more impressive was the landing of the C-130 Hercules aboard the USS Forrestal. Taking place in 1963, this feat still holds the record for the heaviest and largest aircraft to ever touch down on a moving carrier. The tests were performed without an arresting hook or catapult, making the operation much more impressive. An empty C-130 weighs 75,000 pounds, and the aircraft has a fuselage length of 97 feet. On top of that, it has a massive wingspan of 132 feet. Though the concept of a sea-based C-130 was eventually abandoned, the pilot who performed the landing was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross. The United States Navy decided to take a different approach to replace the aging F-14. This resulted in the development of the McDonnell Douglas F-A-18 Hornet. The Hornet was designed with aircraft carrier operations in mind. The aircraft boasted a fuselage that was just 56 feet long and a wingspan of only 40 feet. For even easier storage, the F-18's wings could fold up, reducing its overall width to just 27 feet. Though slower than its contemporaries, the F-18 boasted a range of 1,250 miles and could carry a wide range of formidable weapons. The F-18 resembled the F-15 in many aspects, but the former is far better suited to standard aircraft carrier operations. During the launch, the Hornet pilot maneuvers his aircraft into position, while the front landing gear is attached to the Catabar launch system. Flight deck crews will raise a protective shield to help absorb the blast from the aircraft's twin engines. Once the all-clear is called, the steam piston inside the Catabar launches the waiting aircraft forward at over 150 miles per hour, allowing it to take off with just a few hundred feet of runway. That said, the F-18's 40-plus years aboard aircraft carriers have not been without incident. In one famous example, the F-18 aboard the USS Theodore Roosevelt crashed into the Arabian Gulf shortly after launch. Though the air crew ejected safely, the F-18 suffered a catastrophic engine failure that caused it to sink quickly beneath the waves. In July 2015, Navy divers and explosive ordnance disposal technicians managed to recover the wreck of the aircraft and all its associated technology, which the Navy did not want falling into enemy hands. To prevent incidents like this, the Navy has its pilots undergo Field Carrier Landing Practices, or FCLPs. This allows pilots to increase their familiarity with the restrictions common when operating from an aircraft carrier. It also gives ground crews a chance to make sure the aircraft is working as required and to provide experience with regular repairs and maintenance. In the end, the hope is that consistent practice will translate to improved performance in the field. That's the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss any of our new content. See you next time.